My name is Ian Laudis. I work with Square Enix on their backend services. That means pretty much whenever any game connects or any user goes online, you come through our service, and that is what we handle. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about going from legacy to event sourcing. When we started out, we had a very traditional uh, database setup with some Ruby, some MySQL, very, uh, very generic legacy setup. We've all turned that into microservices with Elixir, and now we've been moving to the next phase, which is splitting it up even more and going for event sourcing. I'll be giving a short introduction to get everyone up to speed with what event sourcing is, uh, what CQRS is, what DDD is, just very quickly go through the different topics so that everyone has a base to work with. After that, we'll be looking at the actual practical use of each of those. Just judging by the slide, it might look like a very abstract uh, conceptual talk, but it's far from that. The talk could also have been called Quasier, an Elixir library for event sourcing. It's something we're using, something we wrote to handle event streams. It comes with cold storage, agents, projections, DDD, an explorer for debugging. But that's all a sales pitch. It's not really important right now. It's just that all the concepts I just mentioned before, they come back in this. So let's see what it's all about. So event sourcing, CQRS, DDDD, very short introduction. I won't be doing any of those any honor. It's going to be a very basic, very opinionated, I would say, description of each to fit the talk and fit our use. I would say for everyone, I can advise you, if you're not familiar with them, go look them up, see how they actually work, how the actual generic concept is supposed to work and not just the one that I'm describing here. So I'm going to do them one by one because if you try to describe them all at once, it's going to become a little bit of a mess. I've had a few stand-ups where a question, something like, hey, this thing that we have in our legacy system, how's that going to translate to the new setup, has made me turn into Charlie Day going like, <laughs> well, you have the commands and then the events, and they get projected, and then you read it. You don't read it now, you read it later. And that turns it into a whole complex thing. Well, each part is actually quite understandable. Well, most of it. So <laughs> to start with event sourcing. Event sourcing is pretty much something that works a little bit on the data layer, the storage of the application. And it functions a little bit like a ledger. It is a replacement or a companion to the more traditional setups like key value, where you just have a key and you store your data or object under that key, or the often used relational or NoSQL databases where each object or each user is a row in a table and you look up the data for the user. An important thing is that every time you want to mutate your data, like update a username, change an email address, what you actually do is go into the table or look up the key and change the actual value that is stored there. Event sourcing does away with that and says every mutation, every bit of data is actually an event that you add to a list of events or a stream and those together form your eventual data. So instead of updating a username, you add an event to your list of events that says set username with the new username. And then the whole set of events, when you replay them, so you start out with, for example, a user that registered with a certain name, then it set an email, then it set a username, 
A week later, we set another username for some weird reason. Then, if we want to know the current username, we go through all the events. Remember the last username set, so if we go through time replaying them first, we, for example, set it to Bob, and then later when we find a new event, we set it to Frank, and then to answer the question, what is the current username, that would be Frank. The advantage of this over the traditional setup with the rows is that if we ever want to know what Frank was known as before Frank, we can go back through the history and see, hey, this user used to be Bob. There are also disadvantages. We are now storing not just one row of data, we're storing a whole bunch of little bits of data. Asking what the username is isn't simply a lookup, like, hey, what's the username? No, no it's replaying everything to find out what the final username used to be. So, lots of disadvantages. The library is going to help with those disadvantages, and we'll come back to that. Then, seek URS, or as it is written out, command query responsibility segregation. What that means is, instead of doing CRUD, where you create, read, update, delete, you split the responsibilities of your logic. You make a part dedicated to just writing, updating, deleting, and a part that's responsible for querying the data. This creates the option to optimize your reading for the use it has. So even though you have users, on login, you might only be interested in things like the password and email to check if it's OK. While if we're displaying data for customer support, we're interested in way more data. And by splitting the queries and not just making it one model that we update and read, by splitting them, we can optimize the reads to fit the purpose they have. It isn't saying you have to do that, but it allows us to, because of the split, perform those optimizations. Then the final one, DDD. And this one, this one is actually hard. I couldn't get a proper short description of <laughs> proper domain-driven design into like a few words. Hence, I stole this picture, well, store. I took this picture, someone made a very nice diagram that illustrated kind of the complexity when it comes to proper domain-driven design. And this is where I'm going to just scale it down and reduce it to a core principle for the talk. Again, the whole concept is way bigger. It has lots of definitions for entities, services, specs, repos, factories. It's a whole setup that works together in a very specific way. But I'm going to reduce it to we roll write code, or we write code to fit the business logic of a company. That company uh, has a certain language in itself, as in the marketing department doesn't talk the same way as, for example, legal or... They might, but let's assume that the different departments have their own little domain they work on. But they all share data, like if we all have our users, Customer support uses our users very differently from how marketing uses our users. But in our code, we're all writing the users as one generic model that's supposed to support all of these different domains or contexts within the business. Domain-driven design says, like, instead of making this one big generic user that's supposed to fit all these different domains within the company, these different contexts, we should change our code or update our code and write it specifically for that certain context. So the user that our code uses when it's doing business logic for the marketing department doesn't look like our user in our code when we're working for customer support code. It's the same user, but even in our code, 
we're already making these contexts of what the language of that department is and how they are using the data instead of using the generic one. This, these three concepts all fit nicely together to make a whole that, in my opinion, is greater than the sum of their parts. The event sourcing definitely has its drawbacks, but when you combine that with CQRS, which splits reads and writes, then suddenly our event sourcing, which has the disadvantage that reading is kind of awkward because we're replaying everything just to get what we currently have, by splitting it, we can make our writes just the act of adding events, and the reads we can get, for example, from a more traditional database that we continuously update our stream of events into. So instead of having to ask, like, hey, what's this username, and go through all the events, we have, every time we've been adding events, we have been updating a table that also has the username in it, and when we query, because we split it with CQRS, the query goes to that projection, as we call it, to get the username really quickly. The source of truth is still that stream of events. That table where we just have the username as well is pretty much just like a cache, a projection to optimize the reads. If we lose that projection because everything is lost or if something happens and we're kind of like, Oof, I don't know if this thing, this thing might have messed itself up because this doesn't make sense anymore. We can always rebuild the whole thing by replaying the history of our events. And then if you add DDD on top, which has kind of the awkward thing where you're splitting your user in the different domains, which is kind of awkward because we still, in a traditional setup, have our database and our database is just that row, and we can split it with relationships, and then we load only partly the relationships, but in the end, our database still contains the whole user instead of the contexts, the different context-based users. If we do the event sourcing, we can set up a projection that is specifically made to fit the context of the business. So we can make, for example, our marketing department use a projection, so that traditional cache, and all the events have been projected into that cache to form a user that is perfectly fit for the use of marketing. It doesn't have any data like last IP logged in and password and stuff like that. Marketing shouldn't touch that at all. It shouldn't even know that that exists because that's all for, the dif for different contexts, different departments. Marketing should just have email for sending emails, uh, which games they played, stuff like that. So that projection only contains that. And that is why these three so nicely fit together and make each other like, work better. Because without projections and without splitting the reads and writes, event sourcing would be kind of awkward because it would be ridiculously slow to replay everything. So then, to start, just the basic event sourcing. So we're going to start all basic. We're going to ignore again all the CQRS, all the DDD, just from the start. Let's just get the events flowing. Well, we made Quasier for that. And if you look into Elixir, there are actually quite a lot of libraries that support CQRS. And usually with an event sourcing, um, plug-in or extension or back-end, because they usually go really well together. Uh, take Commanded, for example. Great, I guess it's more like a framework, but great framework, great library to get CQRS running. Quasier isn't a CQRS library. It's an event sourcing library. And why that is, we'll get back to that later. To properly be able to work with the events, we need to set some constraints. And for now, the only two, event, the only two constraints I'm going to set is events are immutable. So just like a proper ledger, when you add the event to the ledger, it's set 
You can't change it anymore, so you can change your set username to another new username. That one is for always set. If you want to update that because you made a mistake, the only way to correct that is to publish an additional event that corrects the previous one. Second one, the events are always ordered. The order is guaranteed. Without that constraint, things would get kind of confusing. Take the username thing, for example. If we would have usernames that kept switching in order, it becomes very confusing about what the current username is. So the order is a necessary constraint to keep the whole system running. Well, we have now tiny little bits of data that we want to store in a ordered list, an ordered stream, and then want to read back. There are many backends that support it. The traditional one is Kafka. It has these topics. You can write streams. You can add listeners that can get new, that can get like callbacks when a new event gets published, which is ideal for, like if I said, if you want to update a projection, you listen for the event of a new, you listen to a new event, the new event comes in, you update the projection, and everything stays in sync. Great one. Uh, there are ones like Event Store that are purpose built just to provide storage for event sourcing. And then you have the more traditional storages that have also added in support that makes it easier to set up these event streams. Take Redis, for example, since Redis 5, you have something called streams, which are perfect for storing events. They automatically increment, they have order, perfect fit. Postgres also supports it. You need to use, well, a little bit of magic, but apart from that, it works out of the box as well. So to get working on this, I'm setting up a practical example. Let's say we're making a website where people can play arcade games. It was sort of an easy way of picking the names. Um, they can register and they get points if they win games and those points carry over. It's just a simple example. We won't even be using most of it. It's just to give a little bit of, of context. So how do we start? Using Quasir, you define an event pretty much like an Ecto schema. Oh, it's luckily big enough. So what I'm saying here is we have an event. The event belongs to a user and the user play game. I made a mistake here because an event is something that has happened, so I should have called it played game and not play game. I've updated that in the later slides. Forgot this one. So played game only has a game. That's all we need to know. We're just interested in the user played this game. That's it. Then to create that event, as you can see, you do create, you pass the game, because it needs a game to be able to create it, and it returns you the event. It will say unpublished, because without uh, publishing the event, it doesn't have an offset yet, it isn't committed yet, it's just a potential change. It's not set in stone yet. If you don't supply any of the necessary details, it will error out telling you what it is missing. Now, for security purposes, we might want to add an additional field like IP, because we've had some reports of users getting their accounts stolen, so we want to make sure that if suddenly their IP comes from a totally different country, maybe something's up, but to build a proper profile, we need some historic data. I deal with events, because we can replay all the events, see what their IP is, we can map it over time because every event has a timestamp. Perfect. But first problem, IPs are kind of sensitive. And nowadays with GDPR and just general good practices, we don't want that IP getting lost in the logs or <laughs> floating around when someone happens to look, when it's printed in the debug screen or something. So Kvazir supports for every type and every field a sensitive flag, which if you set it for a field will do its best to obfuscate in some sort of way the data when being 
inspected or looked at. The, the actual thing is still there in the payload. It's just hidden to make sure nothing gets out. And that, for example, looks like something like this. We just white out the middle bits. Uh, we, we still have enough information to kind of debug what is going on, but we don't have the actual IP. To support this, it's a simple callback. So, uh, so yeah, a simple behavior where every type just needs to implement an obfuscate that takes the data and returns something that doesn't really make sense anymore. Well, this is great, but I just said that all our events are immutable. So we have now got some historic data we've collected from people playing games, and we've now added a field. So now a newer deployment might want to read back all the old events, and suddenly we're stuck, because the new deployment says, like, hey, wait, a played game event is supposed to have an IP, and this thing I'm reading doesn't have an IP at all. I'm confused, don't know what to do. Simple solution, of course, would be setting a default IP. It's not perfect, or making the IP optional, also not perfect. Why? By, not, by doing those things, we would make it optional to set, which means anything publishing new events could be allowed to publish them without IP. And that's definitely not something we want. We want to have a way to say, like, hey, if you get an old event, just do something with the IP, but we still want to enforce the IP being included in the newer ones. So what we added is versioning. You can add versions to it that follow just the normal SEM versioning. You can add an optional date. All of this was set up because at the start, everything turned out to be very confusing if you weren't following along what was happening. So everything supports a lot of documentation at the code level that comes out as an inspector to show you everything that happened, just to make it a little bit less confusing of all the things going around. This at least tells us that this event is slightly different than the ones we might have stored. Every event starts out with a 1.0. This 2.0 just says, like, hey, we're slightly newer. Doesn't solve our problem yet. We could have gone for just creating a new event. We could have said, like, play game is now a historic event. We create a, a new event. But that just turned out to us naming things played game dot v2 and play. And that just became an ugly mess, because in your code, you don't want to be looking at which type of, which version of the event we're working with. No, we have the played game event. Might be newer, but we don't want to go around and renaming it. So to solve this, there is also the option to create upgrade blocks. Upgrade blocks work pretty much like your Elixir dependencies, matching-wise. Whenever an event comes in, it will check if it needs to be upgraded. In this case, we cannot solve the problem of not having an IP, as in we can't magically make an IP. <laughs> we can't magically go back and ask the user for the IP. So our only practical solution is, for example, setting it to 0, 0, 0 to say, like, hey, we, we just don't know. But what this does do is we can still now read the old events. On reading, it will be upgraded. We can use them, and we still enforce that new events include an IP. So we didn't make it optional. We didn't set a default, but we can still read our old events. This is now our base for adding and uh, reading events. Then we ran into the new problem. If you start making streams of events, and we wanted to make them contained, we needed some way to filter these events to make sure that we could get the events from one user or the events from another user, but not all events. There are some cases where we wanted all events, but we wanted some way to index them in a way. In comes a key. A key, and why this is important will come a little bit later, is pretty much just saying like all these events have a key that is, for example, their user ID. 
You can reuse the type, you can write your own type, doesn't really matter. In this example, the user ID is just an integer. Why did we go for a, like an explicit type? That's because of this next problem. We had a nice user topic where we were pushing all the events in. But all our users were ending up in the same stream of events, which made that single stream humongous. And it made it a hassle to read. And even though some storages, because the library is generic, so if you picked Kafka, Kafka does support partitioning your data over different partitions, but that wouldn't generically translate to, like, for example, if I was using Redis or Postgres, we would lose that ability. And it wasn't predictive. We couldn't predict what Kafka was going to do with our user. We could guess, but our code couldn't know, like, if I have this user, I need to look in that partition, which was a big problem for us. So the keys were introduced because they have a special function, and that is a partition function. That needs to be implemented for each key to make sure that when an event comes in for a certain ID, or when we're trying to look for events for a certain user ID, we already know how to partition it. This is also because partitioning in Kafka, you are set in the amount of partitions. So if we wanted to say like, hey, we do 10 partitions, we couldn't really easily change it to like 100 later on. This system allows us to redefine our partitions easily and then re-read and publish them. It's still quite of a hassle. It's not the ideal, like not the perfect solution, but it works for us to segment our data and not create big clumps of data. It does add an additional constraint for us, and that is we said that ordering is important, but now that we're splitting our data in partitions, partitions that could be split on different machines, we cannot easily guarantee that every event is in order anymore, the original ones they came into. So we're limiting it to saying per partition. So our events will stay in order per partition, which means that most likely they're also kind of in order in the general one, but per partition is guaranteed. Since this also guarantees that one user will always go to the same partition, it is not that much of a hassle because at least for one user, you will always know that their events are in order. Then the final bit, which is actually easier, you just define the stream to create multiple streams. We call them topics. You say, we have a topic users. It uses the user ID as key. Let's say we give it a thousand partitions and it only has the play game event. That's the only one. We looked into adding auto discovery event of events, which was a little bit hard because loading the dependencies in different orders made them not be aware of each other. And uh, it turned out to be really finicky. We were thinking of storing the whole module in the payload, but that made the whole system very Elixir dependent because switching to another language suddenly made that module name not that useful anymore. So in the end, we just decided, if you make a topic, you just tell us which events we can find in there. If you try to publish or read something that isn't part of these events, we'll just error out or discard it, depending on how you configure it. The easy use is then, you use them as a stream, and they will be a lazy stream that is usable in Elixir as any enumerable is. So you can filter on user ID, you can filter from offset, because not always do we want to start all the way from the back. We might want to say like, hey, let's, let's start here. I already knew that we were here. For example, say that we've been projecting a user into a table. We want to continue doing that. As long as the table knew what the last event was that it handled, we can say like, hey, just, just start from that event. Don't start all the way from the start. Just start from there. <coughs> that is all allowed. Works as any enumerable. Funny thing I found out about Elixir. If you try to slice these things, because they're endless, if you try to slice them, 
it will not end at all. I, I, I spend a night thinking like, what did I do wrong in my innumerable generation that I cannot slice this thing? Until I started looking into how this slice works in Elixir, so enum.slice, it actually counts all the elements, which in case you have an endless stream, that will never finish. It will always hang trying to count all the little bits. I looked into it because I was like, hey, why don't you just, if I'm slicing from one to six, if we have six things, you can just stop, we're done. It isn't that easy because you can obviously also slice from uh, five to minus one, which means like from the end, which doesn't work if you don't know what the end is. So in the generic sense, it will always try to read the whole thing. So in this case, every stream also comes with a built-in slice so you can do proper slicing. But that is just so everyone's aware and don't spend like a night trying to figure out where their slices just keep going forever. Um, this is all great, works, we have streams, we have events, everything's rolling. But then we ran into practical limitations. We had been shopping around for places to store events and eventually ended up with a Confluence supplied Kafka, which was great worked, but it came with the problem of retention. They were like, well, and most Kafka setups are, we can store your events, we can store your data, but after 30 days, or if you pay a lot more, after <laughs> many more days, eventually these things will disappear, which if they are the source of truth for your user, is definitely not great. If suddenly, <laughs> there were also many different si other side effects like trying to read from offset one, the first event, if that event has fallen off because of retention, we can't really start reading from there. And then the code got all messed up. Lots of issues with that. Apart from that, there's also the concern of storage space because you just keep expanding and expanding. It's not even that if you get more users that you need more storage. No, as long as users keep doing things, you will keep needing more and more storage the cost, and then a final one that threw us off was we just defined our events as immutable, as an immutable source of truth that is always an order. And in comes GDPR with users that say, hey, I want you to forget everything about us. And then we have Kafka, which is like, no, no, we, we remember everything in order, and you can't just pick out the bits you want to delete. Best we can do is you read the whole thing filter it and write it into a new one, which takes a massive amount of effort. And if you have to do that for each GDPR deleted user, you spend lots of time doing that. So all these problems combined made us go looking for a solution, a solution that would solve our retention problems, our GDPR problems, with this setup at least, and all the storage space and cost. I mean, we're not gonna get around to needing more storage space because we store data, so more data, more storage, that's just a given. But we did find a solution to our events, and that is moving them to different places. So instead of keeping them all in Kafka, which is really optimized for adding and notifying others that something has been added, moving them to places where they're less hot, but are easy to read back and then just stably stored. And we might want to do that for different layers of cold storage. So in our current setup, for example, we move everything from Kafka into Postgres, from Postgres into another Postgres, and from there it gets zipped up in a file and uploaded to be stored as a file somewhere. Because what we noticed is, as long as you keep your pro projections up to date, there is really no need to ever go back to the first event ever. Only if you, for example, add a new projection or something got messed up, do you need to go back. Which, you can probably take some time to read it, instead of having to have it right now. And that allowed us to optimize, certainly enough, that turned the whole thing into a game of where are my events? Are they there? 
Are they in Kafka? Are they in Postgres? Kafka was still throwing them away. We didn't know where they were ending up. <laughs> they could be ending there. They, they were in AWS, uploaded as a file. They were all over the place. So in the end, what Quasir actually does is supply you with a framework to make all these storages from a user perspective, so using the library, seem as one endless stream. In the background, all of these are all over the place, from cold to hot, but as a user, as a programmer using it, it is just one stream, you read it, and it simplifies a lot. And that is why at the core, it's not a CQRS library, but it's an event sourcing library. And that is the reason why we didn't go for one of the standard ones, but we tried, or we went for writing our own solution to solve the problems of having cold storages and wanting your events. This, by chance, also solved our GDPR issue, because if you set your Kafka to only retain events for the amount of time a GDPR request has, then after that much time, they will automatically fall out of Kafka and be lost. And the other cold storages, like Postgres and AWS, stuff like that, we can actually go in and delete things for a specific user. So we made our immutable events kind of GDPR deletable. <laughs> <It's a laughs> they're slightly less immutable, but only in the cold storage way. Um, to close it off, how do you now actually use it? Because now we have lots of events and Everything is all over the place. Because everything is a generic stream, everything is just usable as you would use any enumerable. Say we wanted to have a projection of, I, I did this for a specific user instead of all. Say that I just want to know for this user what uh, games that user played and how many times. Just a simple reduce will give us the answer. This obviously gives you the answer in real time as in from the source, and it will rebuild it in real time, which might be slow. Turn this into something that listens to the events. So start the stream and just keep it running and running and running and running, because the streams can be endless. And you have something that every time a new event comes in automatically updates itself. So when you read it, you have the live version without having to wait. Then, <laughs> We ended up on CQRS, but I'm not looking at the time because I heard we had a little bit less time. Okay, we'll do it real fast. So this was just the event sourcing part. Then, this is great as a storage, but all our traditional code was like, take a user, update the username, put this back in the database. Doesn't work really well with this stream because we can only store the mutations. If we want to read it, we can't really go like, hey, give me the user. We we need to look it up in a special projection. And that is why we came to CQRS, which worked really well together, and started working with commands. And this is why it really fits well with Elixir and Erlang. We modeled our CQRS as agents, which just fits perfectly with the OTP model. Every agent is a user. So for every user using our website, there is a little process running doing its thing, and that process is just there to get commands, which are instructions saying, like, do this, update that, go play a game, something like that. And every command, as a result, emits one or more events. They can also emit zero events, but usually that's not the case, because that means it was kind of like a no-op, which means you had side effects, and you probably don't want that. So one or more events are usually emitted. Then the projections come from the events and the are read it, sorry, read it, <laughs> read by the library that automatically splits off the reads. So when I ask for a user, it will use the appropriate model, but when I send the command to change it, it will go to the agent. The agent will then emit the events deals go into the stream, the stream is read, goes into the projection, and then when the website tries to, for example, compare username and password, 
it reads it from the projection. This, of course, adds a little bit of latency, and the agents also weren't really liking it, because <laughs> the agent was allowed to emit events, but because the source of truth is the stream of events, every time the agent had to, to see if it was actually allowed to perform that command, read back its own state from the events before it could perform it. Made it horribly slow. The processes helped because the agent could, as long as it was active, keep its state. So as long as the agent was running, it could on startup read its state back from the events, process the commands, events would come out and get committed, and it would immediately update its own state on those events. But any time the agent would go down or crash or it was a new user, it would just take way too much time. We also added, because after a while we had so many processes running, and most of our users come to our website, use it for a little bit, and then they're off to never be seen again for a day, more than a day. And we had all these processes running that weren't doing anything but just sitting around. So they did get killed after a while. Um, and this is where the state comes in. First, the commands real quick. Same thing as the events, same types, same settings for sensitive and stuff like that. Same way to create them, pretty much ties in together to the same system, going really fast to it. Then here come the agents. You define them by saying, hey, we have an agent, which is a user agent. This one manages all the little agents that are instances of the actual uh, users. So this is like a supervisor managing all the little agent processes that represent our users. Um, the cache is to solve the problem of the startup. Because every time a user would shut down because their process just timed out because it was like, I haven't done anything in 15 minutes, I'm going down. And then when it, the user came back, it took forever to load. We just wrote the state to a cache, very generic, and then when the agent starts, it reads its cache, sees what the last event was, asks the stream, hey stream, uh, can you give me the events from this point onward? Should be fine, because if everything was fine, there are no events, because the agent generates the events, so there should not be anything in between. And it could just start right away. The only reason that it would ever have to read again was if the state got lost or the agent crashed while updating its state, something weird in between. So it's more of a fail safe. The entity itself would then be defined by the structure of its state. In this case, since we're doing just the gameplays, we would say, well, a user agent just has a field called games where it tracks its games. It's an array of strings. That's it. If we start a new user, we just give it an empty list. Done. Then we define the two other things, which is apply. Apply is when an event comes in, we apply it to the state and we return a new state or error out if something wrong happened. This obvious, well, obviously, this should actually never happen. Because an event only comes from a command, and the commands already verify whether the state is appropriate to perform this action. Everything that wasn't appropriate should have erred out at that point. So any event coming in and erring out means that, that something actually went really wrong because we apparently let a command through that should never have been allowed to happen. Then after that, an execute which says like, hey, we get the commands play game and all we do is emit an event called play game because we have no business constraints or anything that says that we are not allowed to do this. In a normal scenario, and I'm just dropping that whole DDD part, this would be where DDD begins because here a game played, no constraints, just go ahead. Say that you would need to actually own the game to play it, then here would be the place where your agent starts calling your domain, your business logic, to say like, hey, I got a request to do this. 
this is the state of the user. Is this allowed? Can I do this? Can I not do it? And then based on that, decide whether or not to emit the event. Um, that would be the DDD, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll cut it short here. Yeah, then that would be a very quick practical look at event sourcing CQRS, and then we left the DDD out, and how to use that in your complex applications to model users. Yeah. All right, very interesting, thank you. You're actually uh, right on, you schedule it very well because you're <laughs> actually 40 minutes uh, <laughs> straight. <so. laughs> yeah, thank you again. Is there maybe one question while the next speakers are setting up? Uh, okay. Over here. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, I have several question marks, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I would oh, just yeah, ask yeah. one. Uh, what about, how are you handling uh, reprocessing events uh, if some uh, federal error happen. Sorry, when what type of error happens? I don't know, something, I don't know, the agent uh, oh, so crash or whatever. So the agents all fit into the Erlang OTP. So when an agent crashes, the agent supervisor is aware that the agent just went down. It will bring the agent back up saying like, hey, I think something just happened because you were gone. The agent at that point doesn't know anything about its state. So what it will do is it will first check the cache to see what kind of state was stored there. If that state was also lost in the crash, for example, when we started out, the cache was an ETS table and not an external thing. So sometimes crashes would lead to the ETS table also going down. If it detected that, it would see that the last event its state was based off uh, was not actually the last event in the stream. So what it would do is would say to the stream, hey, I just got back. Give me all events that belong to my user, starting at this point that I still know everything was OK. It replays those and updates the state accordingly. If it crashes again, because it's just something in that stream of events that makes it crash, then it will, if I remember correctly, we set it up to retry one more time, and if it then again crashes, then it's just like where something is just wrong with this thing, and it can't get back on its own, so if someone needs to look at what happened to its state. In most cases, it will just rebuild and continue. So apart from additional time for initial load, there would be no noticeable effect for the user because it would just rebuild from the stream of events. Cool, uh, what about rate limiting? Do, th does this library handle in some way uh, some kind of this problem that you may have? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by rate limiting. So. If you mean by rate limiting of the API, that is just handled on where the API comes in. So that is uh, the, uh, like the limit on how many events we can process at the same time. That we solved by doing the partitions because the limit was definitely real. But because we added the partitions to spread our users or our events over as many partitions as we wanted, that means that for each partition, because the order is only guaranteed per partition, we can read simultaneously, increasing the limit pretty much by how many partitions we have. All right, thank you very much.